Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Be reading verses 8 through 16. This is a little bit of a cage rattling sermon for some people. For others, it's quite liberating. Either way, the end goal is the same. Unlock that cage and set my people free. We are looking at faith. The book of Hebrews is a book to fuel and to ignite faith. Fuel faith by setting before the eyes of faith Jesus. Igniting faith. By encouraging its exercise. And not to disengage. We have looked at what faith is. What it's fundamentally concerned with in verses 1 and 2. We and 3, uh, we looked last week at verses 4 through 7. The primal men of faith, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And this week we're looking at patriarchal faith. Fundamentally Abraham, but also the text includes Isaac and Jacob as well. As sojourners upon the promised land. Be reading Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, indeed, send to us the Spirit from heaven, that we might understand aright your promises to Abraham, your promises to us as heirs along with him by faith in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. My intention is to provide for you as dear, thirsty for living waters, that refreshment. But I fear in some cases it may be dear in the headlight instead. May God have mercy upon us all to see with a new and crisp clarity of what the Word of God has to say to us. So let us today with great earnestness focus our attention upon the Word of God. The author of the Hebrews has written this exhortation, he calls it, under the inspiration of God. This book of the New Covenant is the Word of God. It's part of what the Son of God has come to say as we read about in the very opening verses of this very book. 
what he's come to say to us as the gathered community in these last days. The author of the Hebrew is 100% convinced that human history is headed to a day that will issue in two permanent outcomes. Eternal fire of God's justice as one outcome. And the other outcome, eternal joy in God's holy heaven through Jesus Christ. As we rush toward that great day, God has acted in history to fulfill the old covenant in his son, Jesus Christ, as the prophet, the priest, the king. Christ has made a sacrifice of himself upon the cross that we might know the forgiveness of our sins. He has risen and ascended to heaven. There he now ministers as a high priest providing on the basis of his sacrifice mercy and grace tangibly, existentially in our lives as those who seek to draw near to God. His heavenly kingdom has been secured by his perfect righteousness. And already he is reigning on high. And just as we confess in the Nicene Creed, he will come and bring an end to this world, and he will replace it with his unshakable kingdom. And we will perish if we do not have vital faith in Christ. Therefore, Christ, the prophet, has spoken to us in his word. He continues to speak to us by his ordained servants. Christ continues to say, through his ordained servants and the basis of his word, come, come to Christ by faith personally and come to Christ corporately and join yourself to the worshiping community that gathers to draw near to him. But though Christ has come and this community is already formed, the author of the Hebrews has this exhortation. Why? Because he is seeking to confront a perennial problem, then and to this day, a problem of drifting from Christ. Have you drifted from Christ in your life? Have you sensed any pull away from Christ? If you haven't, you're not even in the battle. You don't know the current if you don't feel its pull within you. The author of the Hebrews wants us to know that the pull is there and not allow the current to pull us away from Christ. The author of the Hebrews wants to correct this innate tendency toward dullness, toward unbelief. And what's his correction that he gives us here in this glorious book? Faith. <laughs> Faith. Faith that does not draw back. Faith that does not shrink back, but continues to draw close to Christ and won't let go of Him. And so we come now to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, he wants to, he's already clarified what faith is, what it possesses. He, we've looked at the three primal men of faith. And now he's introducing us to the three patriarchs of faith. And how that faith now is advancing from the primal three to the patriarchal three. Now faith has always been the living dynamic of all God's people. That is how they draw near to God. That is how they look forward to heaven. That is how they stand firm, uh, though the current pulls them strongly. <laughs> faith sees the unseen. Faith tastes the unseen, and it longs for more of what it tastes. And it adheres to them through trial, through temptation, through falling down and getting up. It refuses this world, but it does not refuse. But it trusts in and embraces and confesses through the Word of God. The blessing of drawing near. The blessing of drawing near to these invisible realities through which faith communes with God in heaven above and longs 
for the consummation of God in heaven beyond. Now that great blessing is administered by faith. Faith. Faith is that internal principle, this self-abandonment, this dependency, not independency, this surrender, not willful marching around. And it surrenders to Christ. And in so doing, the faith produces. Faith is that link between us and Christ. That bond between us and Christ that binds us to Him. Faith partakes of Christ as we read in the very first verse. It is, it is the substance of the things hoped for. It's gone into the future and it's got a biopsy of heaven and brings it back into the soul. Oh, I want more of that. I can't get enough of Christ. And it looks for more. Well, the first point in your outline here is promised land, foreign land. It might sound a little odd, but you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get it here in just a moment. Verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. When you read that, that should cause a little confusion in your mind. Are you going to see why? The author of the Hebrews now draws our attention here to Abraham, the man of faith. And he says that he sets his sight on things unseen as a man who has his sight set on the hope of heaven. God made a covenantal promise to Abraham. And that covenantal promise to Abraham can be very easily summarized under two points. One, he promised Abraham a place called the promised land. Two, he promised Abraham a filling up of that place with his descendants. A vast seed, right along with him, of course, of that place called the land of promise. You may say we have here the three Ps, right? The promise, the place, and the people. Three Ps. The Abrahamic covenant. Now Abraham showed his faith and his love and trust for God by taking heed to God's call. Leave Ur of the Chaldees. Pack up. Head for a land that God would show you. Head for a place to where you've never been. It says he went out, not knowing where he was going. And yet, here's the big striking point. Here's the big incongruity. Here's that little thing that you call that little worm in your mind says, something's not right here. It's not all fitting in my, my mind. Because he became a resident of what? The land of promise. But Abraham didn't put down roots in the land of promise. Wasn't this the promised land that God intended to give him and his seed? <laughs> Look at verses 9 and 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed or called to a place that he was received as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live. Where? In the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents. With Isaac and Jacob. He lived in the promised land as a foreign land. Only temporary tent pegs would go into the ground there. That's it. It was not. It was not to him. It was not the fatherland of his precious residency that he would embrace 
heartily by faith. You see what the text is saying. The promised land was foreign to Abraham. Now how can that be? <laughs> that was it, wasn't it? If you go back to Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18, in Genesis, God tells Abraham, here's the land, here's the boundaries. Hey, go walk around it, man. This is your land. I'm going to give it to you and your descendants. That's what it says. Doesn't that establish that this is what God had in mind? How much more explicit can the Bible be? Don't we read the Bible literally? <laughs> but Hebrews 11.9 says he lived in the land in tents as if it wasn't. As if he was only temporarily passing through. Isaac and Jacob, who also partook of these promises, took the same position. The earthly promised land, a foreign land, to be temporarily occupied in tents. Now we understand that. If I tell you, hey, I'm resigning, I'm going to move back home. And in between here and arriving back at home, I camp out at various places in a tent. Nobody says, oh, that's weird. I said, that's what you do. He's on his way to another place. <laughs> tent, 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 and home. <laughs> right? We all get that. But what if I went home and I kept the tent? <laughs> God says, here's the promised land. Abraham says, oh, I'm going to live here in a tent. <laughs> Why? You know, the author of the Hebrews explains why. He was looking, verse 10, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, where designer and builder is God. See, Abraham was a man of faith. And being a man of faith, on one side of that coin of faith, he lived in the promised land like it was a foreign land, and he lived on it in tents. <laughs> on the other side of that coin, he was looking to something else altogether. His faith was looking to a, a future city with foundations. Foundations. Tent doesn't have foundations. <laughs> That's a house. <laughs> foundations speak of a permanent building in contrast to a temporary tenting. And this city they were looking to had God as its architect and builder. God is the architect. It's his design. It's his plan. And he built it. Now, that is not a city of this world. They were looking to a city of residency that man did not build. They're looking to a city of residency that had no human fingerprints on it whatsoever. It was not a city of man's brain and man's brawn. It was a city of God's brain and brawn. Of an entirely different character. A city that God would plan and construct. Hebrews chapter 13, 14 says of you and me, we have here no abiding city, but we seek the city which is to come. Is that true of you? You're not a Christian if it's not true of you. <laughs> because that's part of faith. <laughs> but just think about this. Where in the world did Abraham get this idea? 
Where did he get this idea? Here's the land, Abraham. Walk around it. Give it to you and your descendants. Everything, okay, I'll pull out my tent. <laughs> How did he, Abraham get the idea that it's the city to come is what God was promising? The answer to that is faith. Just like what we learned about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is back from the future. It's a biopsy of the future brought into the present. That's faith. Abraham had that faith. He had a taste of it. He had a sample of it. And therefore that taste and sample of that world to come was evidence that was settled in his own mind. And thus, when he came into the promised land, he didn't lay a foundation. He lived in a tent. See, the earthly promised land for Abraham was like a sacrament. It was like a sign and seal of an invisible reality. God showed Abraham a piece of earthly real estate. Abraham surveyed that land and walked about it. And he was walking about it by faith. He walked about it like hinds feet in high places, to speak of Habakkuk 3. In Abraham's mind, while his feet walked, his mind were on things above. His faith was on things forward. Abraham was a man of faith. He had the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Now, if you believe that, it's quite mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling for Abraham, the promised land, was the heavenly land. Even Abraham understood that the earthly real estate was a type. It is a symbol pointing to a greater reality from earth to heaven. And to this very day, there are Bible-believing Christians who do not get this. And what Abraham looked for from a distance, what Abraham 2,000 years before Christ looked for at a distance, Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we draw near to. That's right. We draw near to that promised land in Jesus Christ because he is now there in possession of it, sitting on the throne of it in his heavenly domain. A realm that we enter truly by way of the Holy Spirit in faith. And so though Abraham tromped around that earthly piece of real estate, he did so as a foreign land. And his fatherland he looked for elsewhere. That's what the text says. I'm not making it up. Read it right here. And this is very instructive for us. First of all, it's, it's instructive for us on at least a couple of scores, or probably more if we thought about it. The first thing that's instructive is that the Old Covenant earthly settings, though they may have been promised by God, were mere pointers to something far greater and higher and more vast in the redemptive historical future. That's how we should read our Bibles. And that's not new. For thus we have the good pleasure of reading Calvin's Institutes, exactly what Calvin says in the Institutes back then. But secondly, it's instructive for us in that we should not be pulled back into expectations of the re-emergence 
of earthly types that somehow they're going to enjoy dominance and first status. Let us not be pulled back by looking for the promised land over there in the Mideast as some central place where all things orbit. But let's join Abraham. Let's look upward and look forward to an advanced level like he did. <laughs> and let's realize that at the end of the ages that have dawned upon us is about ready to reveal us what Abraham had in mind. The heavenly world that he saw by faith that we now lay hold of as believing Christians, as worshiping assembly as we draw near to Christ in heaven, the veil is about to be torn back and the invisible about to become visible. So brothers in Jesus, brothers and sisters in Jesus, our grip on this world, we need to loosen up a little. We've got a far greater possession. We have a heavenly one that's on our way, on its way in Jesus Christ. See, the Apostle Paul uh, strikes this as well. It's just not in Hebrews. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Like Abraham. Not on things that are on the earth, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What is now invisible, that we know by faith and the operation of the Holy Spirit, is on its way shortly to become visible. You believe that? <laughs> Let's go on here and consider the people who will populate this land. The natural and the supernatural, 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful and promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So those two verses highlight for us that Abraham's seed, though it is based on the natural, are actually brought about by the supernatural, brought about by the redemptive, life out of death. Isaac, the promised son, emerged out of death into life. And this is the launching point for populating the promised land with Abraham's seed. It informs us that Abraham's seed is founded in the supernatural and the redemptive power of God. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul explains that if you are a believer in the gospel, you are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, you, like Isaac, are a supernatural son of Abraham. Son, you are children of the promise. That's chapters 3 and chapter 4, verse 28. And so Sarah, here she is, Sarah, the woman, is standing in the line of who? Eve, the woman. Eve, the mother of the living. Eve, uh, the seed of the woman uh, that will proceed uh, in opposition to the seed of the serpent. And just as the earthly seed of Abraham would inherit the earthly promised land, read about it in the Old Testament, so the supernatural seed that that is raised up with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies, the true stars of heaven. Those are the ones that were ultimately promised to Abraham, you see. The supernatural sons. 
It's vital that we understand what's ultimately promised to Abraham as a land to possess and who is a people called his seed who will pack into that land like stars in the sky. Now the answer can be found in one single simple word. The answer is heaven. Heaven is the world above, invisible, that will one day be the world visible. It's that world of glory that I read about in Colossians chapter 3 where you will be revealed with him in glory. And the heirs of that world are those who are like Isaac, supernatural sons. They are born from above. Heirs with Abraham and joint heirs with Christ. These, like Isaac, have a supernatural birth. And through faith, they're sons of the promise. And they have that heavenly land. And they are the people promised to Abraham who were not confined to this world, but were like him, strangers and exiles, only temporarily occupying the earth as a foreign land because like him you see they're looking to a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God so you see what Abraham looked to a heavenly land you see what Abraham looked to a supernatural Seed born from above, patterned after Isaac. And so what became of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? What became of them? Look at verse 13. These all died in faith. Not having received the things promised, but having seen them and Greeted them from afar. That idea of greeting is, is embracing. You, you haven't seen someone for a long time. You greet them. You embrace them. So it's just not say, oh, well, you know, got a greeting card from heaven. No. This is, this is they greeted them. They embraced them from afar. And, and having confessed, that's homo legao, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. So here it is. The author of the Hebrews states very plainly, they died in faith, not having received the things promised. But didn't they enter the promised land? Here's the land. Go to it. Survey it. Walk around it. No. They only received the earthly sacrament. They are still waiting for what it really meant. Because that wasn't what God really promised was the earthly. And neither was it what they longed for in that promise. So if we are to be faithful to this text here in Hebrews 11, if we're to be accurate in our exegesis of the Bible, we have to reject all the typical premillennial hermeneutics that has God holding out to Abraham or to Israel some plop of ground over in the Mideast. We need to reject the idea that God's redemptive purposes orbit around some end-time bestowal of the land over by the Mediterranean Sea to Abraham's bloodline. That's bad theology. That's bad exegesis. That is a Judaizing of Scripture. 
John Calvin says, and I agree. And what that does is it casts a very shadowy veil over our great hope that we have. Not only of the patriarchs who refuse to identify the land over there in the Mideast as what they were waiting for, but it also puts a veil over our understanding of the return of Jesus Christ. What's going to happen at the coming of Jesus Christ? There will be a visible unveiling of the heavenly land. A permanent glorious residency of the people of God will be put on view when He returns. We're not going to have Jesus come back and then spend another thousand years on the earth in a kingdom that's ultimately going to somewhat crash and burn as the devil tries to take over again. Uh, is that a hope? Oh, I'm really looking forward to that. No. That's not what the land meant in the first place. And it certainly isn't what the land means in the second place. We're looking forward to the great hope of the heavenly. The new creation. That is what we're looking forward. Let's not veil and confuse and cloud it all over. Note the patriarchal response of faith to the earthly promised land. Note it. They refuse to embrace it. <laughs> Rather, they reached up with outstretched hands, up high. They rose their necks up out of the earthly and looking past it, they looked to the heavenly. Look again at verse 13. They did not receive the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, they acknowledged they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They saw. They embraced. They confessed. Those heavenly realities regarding the promised land. And thus they lived as strangers and exiles on the earthly type. Now you might say by the time of verse 13 comes rolling around here, you say, okay, I, wow, I think I got this. But he doesn't stop. Look at this. Look at verse 14. He doesn't stop. For people who speak thus Make it clear that they are seeking a homeland, a fatherland. That word homeland is a cognitive father. It's a fatherland. Your fatherland, that's where you want to be. <laughs> you know, be back home. Right? But it says they made it clear. It's a compound word for manifest. I mean, they made it most clear. <laughs> It's like, you know, tsh, 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 tsh. do you get this? <laughs> They've made it clear. That's the word there. Manifest. And what did they make so obviously clear? clear? Well, he said it. By refusing the earthly promised land as foreign, they were seeking a fatherland that was heavenly. Where home really resides. Where they're really headed A place and a people of permanency. It's clear. John Walrood of Dallas Seminary used to use this little jingle. He says, the land means land, and that's all land means. That was his famous jingle. Well, I'm sorry, but that is a veil of hermeneutical darkness for Dallas Seminary and all dispensationalism. That is not illuminating, that's darkness. It is clear. It is most manifest. And Abraham got it 2,000 years before Christ. You see that? Abraham got it 2,000 years before Christ. Why shouldn't any Bible-believing Christian not get it 2,000 years after Christ? It's clear. 
The things promised and embraced and confessed by Abraham was not the earthly promised land. It was the heavenly. This is not a new idea. This didn't just come about in a few years. And, well, we don't like this dispensational stuff. Here's, here's the alternate. No. This is what we sing about. I mean, based on a Jewish text of 1404, the God of Abram prays. The God of Abram prays at whose supreme command from earth I rise and seek the joys at his right hand. I all on earth forsake its wisdom, fame, and power, and him my only portion make my shield and tower. He by himself has sworn, I on his oath depend, I shall on eagles' wings upborn to heaven ascend. I shall behold his face, I shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. The earthly was not it. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. The heavenly God is not ashamed to be called God of the heavenly people, for he has prepared for them a city. If they had been thinking on an earthly plane upon arriving in the promised land, what would have happened? They left Ur of the Chaldees. That was an advanced metropolitan city of that era. They had it all. Oh, we're going to go wander out here. They get to the promised land. They're looking around going, mm -hmm. right? They didn't do that. <laughs> Why? Because they're seeking the heavenly. They're seeking to respond to God's call on the heavenly. They were after a better heavenly country. And they're good with the downgrade. Temporarily. Because they were in pursuit of sublime communion with God. They were in pursuit of the sublime consummation of the heavenly of which they had a taste. Men of faith. They tasted the very substance. They longed for the day when they would be seated at the full table. They did not return. How about you, people of faith, 4,000 years removed from Abraham? 2,000 removed from the resurrection and ascension to Christ to claim the heavenly land. How about you? What's got your attention? The eyes of sight and sense as you feast your eyes and heart on things below. You're all caught up in the modern metropolis and all that glitters. The 21st century version of Ur of the Chaldees. Or has the veil been lifted for you? to make clear to the eyes of faith the superior spiritual communion with God through Jesus Christ as your high priest in the heavenlies. You pack in light, you weighed down for the journey. Brothers and sisters, let's join the patriarchal men of faith who are not absorbed thinking about this earth and its sensual offerings let us join them. Let us look to, let us embrace, let us confess to this world. We're strangers and pilgrims here. We've got a permanent residency that we're tasting of. We can't wait to get to the full feast. May that be what you share with these patriarchal fathers. Yes, you see it. Yes, I embrace it. <laughs>
And yes, I am willing to say to a blind world, I confess it too, even though you don't get it. Because by God's grace and by his grace alone in Jesus Christ, I get it. I won't let go. Amen?